So, get everybody and get a Soldier X, mate. It is great to have you back and and well. How are you going? Well, you know, um, alive. It's the main thing. Um, you know, just yeah, just just glad to be in in one piece, really. Um, yeah, SBU didn't grab me. FSB didn't grab me yet. So um, yeah. Well, that, just happy to be with everyone. That's always always the goal, mate, not to get grabbed by some um, some post-Soviet intelligence service somewhere. Look, we've sort of been keeping a little bit of track, and you and I have been keeping um, together. And for those who didn't know, um, and I hope I'm not spilling anything here, but I actually ended up getting passed off like a like a death package from you too. Like, hey, if anything happens to me, Willie, this you need to talk about it. This and this and this. Um, thankfully that hasn't happened to you, but can you talk about, I guess, what's been happening with you currently and where you are? Yeah. So I, I, I definitely, um, I, I want to start off firstly, apologize for, for not being, uh, on air as much. I, I had to go dark, um, mainly for two reasons initially, because, um, there, there were, there were sort of allegations flying about if people, people might not remember the last interview, uh, there were people trying to contact people I work with back in Australia, um, supposedly on behalf of the Ukrainian government, SPU, whoever, um, it turned out that was flagrant bullshit, but the people were getting very angry at, at some of the stuff that I thought was, I mean, and, and I still believe is, is very vanilla reporting. It was, there was nothing that was dangerous that was leaked in fact i was really just trying to blow the whistle on some pretty very poor conduct that was going to get a lot of people killed and has subsequently so um i do i do apologize uh for that um also you know I, just because of the work i do it's just easier sometimes not to to talk to journos and just f focus on the job and that's what i tried to do in the end it just it, it didn't work um and what's happened recently without getting into too many details um i've had to i've had to flee the country um now i had to flee the country uh not because of i wasn't on any kind of watch list or any of that rubbish or banned or any of this sh shit that people rave on about uh, what happened was is effectively uh, my commander <laughs> uh i i'd been uh paid there was an issue with payment and people being paid those are the wrong amounts or whatever and my commanding officer demanded that i pay him in uh small small amounts effectively into his personal account and that if i didn't do that i would have my legs broken i would not be allowed to leave the country and they would drain my my military account so also just an update for those who who are have been keeping uh, track. I, for the vast majority of my time in Ukraine, w was not paid for really anything. Um, uh, this is a pretty common common story. Um, I finally did get paid. Um, not the amount owed, of course, not even close. So there's a lot of work I've done, which is totally for free. Um, I made about 8,000 US. Um, I gave almost all of that money back to my, my guys and the guys who needed it. Um, and just, yeah, I, I made sure that the commanders didn't, didn't get access to it. And I took about a thousand five hundred for a trip home. So that's basically what's been happening. So I, unfortunately, uh, I had to, I had to flee the country, um, with the help of the U S embassy, um, get across the border and, uh, yeah, luckily made it through in, uh, in one piece. So yeah, it was a sad, sad ending to the story, but yeah. Yeah. A sad, a sad ending to someone who, uh, has been a whistleblower in the right ways as far as you you know you you were calling out things that would actually help ukraine then on the front line of saying you know and calling out western countries saying well if you're giving this say m triple seven howitzer but you're not giving the correct training or the equipment to go along with it like the drones or some other bits and pieces then it's not going to have the effect on the front line that i know that you we're all in on helping Ukraine the best combat effectiveness at the front line possible. And then it seems like bureaucracy and other people have sort of caught up with you. And then, you know, you've had to flee the country because of this. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it's quite, it's, it is, it is very sad and, you know, yeah, it, it was a very difficult experience because 
Uh, no, you know, I mean, the things we were warning about, the things I was trying to warn people about, you know, a lot of them came, almost all of them came to fruition. So as we saw on the Rehibni axis, um, you know, unfortunately, I mean, a lot of those, those troops down there, like they were, they were Western trained. They actually had some, some, some okay training and they weren't necessarily like bad units, but unfortunately, yeah, the, like you know there were things like you know there wasn't we saw there wasn't even a screen you know they had a lack of combined arms control you know i mean there was a there was a there was a total like breakdown and we we yeah we were just trying to we we're trying to raise the alarm on it um i was trying to take it I, was, I i don't give generally my position i don't give i don't work for the australian government um uh i don't I, I I will give reports where it's within the interest of both parties potentially because I, I work if I work for a foreign country it's essentially a partner nation, um so I I, I take that that very seriously so in, in this case I was report I did report back to um, people in in the Australian intelligence community as if you as you've seen in some of these in some of these texts and what I was getting was some like very hostile and sort of anti-Semitic responses unfortunately um which you know is, is very disheartening um to say the least on top of you know the ukrainian response so um to those who don't know uh i came over here um uh, to, to obviously serve um i had my my secondary goal uh which i had been contacted by a number of people in uh, defense industry and certain people in in Canberra and certain connections I have still in the military and a lot of these there were a lot of people who reached out to me who wanted to um come over here and, and support Ukraine and, and my job uh, along with uh other people uh, Glenn Glenn was helping in a, a small capacity um obviously representing a parliamentary delegation nothing military of course but um you know they we were our objective is to try and coordinate that response and sort of develop something that was was effective because when i rocked up it was a total abstract shit fight if from word go there was nothing i rocked up i was they yeah they told me to go to the white tent i ended up working for some dodgy aid organization ukrainian patriot that was supposedly backgroundings uh, like run by former spu partisans some links to spu uh, ran and they were running aid but they also wanted to run some training program and then then at one point I was doing personal protection it was it was a disaster so and I ended up getting into Ukrainian military basically through people knowing people who knew people who knew people which is stupid so we wanted to remedy that we wanted to try and fix that but um unfortunately there's very little interest in reforming Ukraine um, what I've been told even by people who are sort of open to it is it's going to take time. Uh, it's going to be a long process. Um, and in my estimation, I don't really see that being viable for Ukraine. Right. And now that you're outside of Ukraine, is there any, do you feel like there's any threat to you? You know, there's been, of course, many things about hunting down propagandists, hunting down people that work for the Kremlin. And of course, I know you're not a propagandist, all work for the Kremlin, but you never know where people's uh, people's lines are. Do you, do you think there could be anyone who, do, wherever you are currently, we won't dispel that on the podcast, that it may come after you? Do you, do you feel like that's a threat or even back here at all? Um, I'd be more concerned, like physical threats, I'd be more concerned of FSB. Uh, I know they go across across borders to, to hunt down people they don't like. Um, the reality is, is that um, there have already been attempts to reach out to certain members of Australia's parliament and try and essentially white ant, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, yeah, undercut my efforts over here. And that supposedly happened on behalf of different people potentially either connected or in the Ukrainian government. Um, the people I work with in the Ukrainian government are, are, are pretty high up. They're, they're connected to uh, the president and a couple of other people. So I'm, yeah, I, I wasn't too worried about it at the time, but I definitely believe that there's, there's certainly been like a backgrounding on me. And I wouldn't be surprised. What, what I would not be surprised is if the Australian intelligence community has got like a very, has put me on a list somewhere and they've got like some very big hard on for me. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, SPU or Gore coming to, to shoot me. 
uh, that would be a very, unless they had help from someone in Australia, it would be a very stupid thing for Ukraine to do. I'm, I think even the Ukrainians, and there are some fucking stupid people in Ukrainian high command, and I, I think they would, yeah, that would be very dumb. It would be a very dumb battle for them to fight. Right. With the FSB, of course, being Russia's, you know, basic foreign intelligence service, um, do you think there is a threat to these foreign guys who have gone over to Ukraine to either fight or an intelligence role or an advisory role? Because at the end of the day, you know, this war will come and go, but, you know, there's always going to be a folder somewhere, probably in Russia somewhere with, you know, these guys, like these guys who have Instagram and 100,000 followers who are actively fighting in Ukraine with these units against Russia, do you think that there's going to be, you know, that from like the FSB that they, it might always be a little bit of a look over your shoulder with some of this, you know, 30 years on? Um, You'll definitely be on the list. You'll definitely be targeted uh, if it depends where you go in the world. If you go to a, like, if you go to a place that's in, you know, Russia's interest or influence, they, they have bounties on Westerners. So it, I mean, I think that most Westerners are a very low, low priority target in general on the FSB targeting matrix because most intelligence services, you know, special forces reconnaissance have some sort of, you know, targeting matrix to have some sort of, you know, vulnerabilities map they're going to look for. So I, I would say that it, it is a very low level, but I would I would definitely be taking precautions because what the Russians will definitely do is they dox people. Uh, and they have, uh, so obviously there's uh, the erroneous, uh, you know, tracker so-called Nazi Merck, uh, which is a sort of, uh, that's their sort of OSINT uh, arm. And they, they can effectively go out, hunt people down. And, and they do, they do horrible things to people. They, they do horrible people who go to Ukraine. And so, um, yeah, no, it's definitely a concern, uh, which is why I, you know, uh, you know, I try not to be, you know, identified with the work I do over here too much. Yeah, because we've seen, you know, Ukraine's um, leader of the GUR, Kirill Budinov, say, you know, you're going to hunt down Russian, uh, or Russians who have fought or in part of that in any corner of the globe. And we've seen them acting in Sudan, in Africa recently. And we've also seen them, of course, operating in Russia. Uh, that there is, you know, for people on the other side of the fence, there is a real risk down the line that if you're one of these Russian guys, either for PMC or with the Russian military and you are a public figure, that, you know, it does look like that then GUR, SBU may come after you long after maybe that this war uh, is all wrapped up whenever that whenever that happens. And I believe that is that is a real threat. It, it is happening. And there are, and I'm going to speak on this in a video, but I've got to talk to someone about how much I can speak about, about these teams working foreign trying to get these guys who have worked for russia in in capacities yeah i mean we uh so my one of my teams a couple other teams uh we were there were people tangential to us that were sent to africa so i have served in in war previously uh it's my it's primarily mainly where i've worked almost almost exclusively and um I have very little confidence in Guru to achieve much. Now, there's there's a lot of talk about like there's sure I'm sure there must be some like high speed team somewhere, but my experience of Guru and like I wish I could show you the the text or I could show the viewers the texts right now. Maybe in time when things become a little less sensitive for people, um, I could show them. But uh, yeah, no, um, I guarantee you, Guru is is it, it's we we call it. We call it a trailer park branch. So you've got Grand Branch in the US, CIA Grand Branch, you've got Air Branch, you know, you've got Sea Branch. These are the top tier special activities operators. These are guys who are soldiers who are also sometimes trying to spooks. And they go around the world doing the US's bidding, whatever they want to do, you know, special operations generally. Um, and yeah, no, we are, we are a trailer park branch. Uh, every, a lot, I am very, very critical of, Budinov's and Guru's operations. Um, I think there are a few good ops, like uh, in Belgorod, um, the the uh, oil rig operation. Um, but I am just very skeptical. Most of their operations are, are for virtue signaling. They're not really effective combat operations. 
Um, and we saw that with Zap. And that was one of my core complaints to the Australian government, if, we, if people remember. Um, you know, the Zap, Zaporizhia operation was supposed to have been a test. It was supposed to be the proof of concept of U Ukrainian combined arms and the use of the Ukrainian battle group. Um, it turned out to be one of the worst planned operations I think I've ever seen. Uh, it, well, there, there were worse, but it was, you know, it was a disaster. Almost every single vehicle destroyed, uh, all forces routed. I mean, it was just, it was a disaster. Um, so yeah, I do not have a lot of confidence and I, and I think, uh, to be honest, I can dig into this more, but I think, uh, a lot of Budanov's actions, whether, you know, by, uh, intentionally or not have actually, um, imperiled uh, Ukrainian national security and, and also like a lot of other, you know, destabilized, uh, essentially, a, you know, a lot of, a lot of Western operations as well. Right. Is there any way you can go into that a little bit of, of, of that? Sure. So, so my, so like, if we look at some of these, these operations, right. So the, now, firstly, whether I, I have never met General Budanov, I just know people tangential to him and people around him. Um, I don't know either, you know, he doesn't, you know, his one option is, you know, he doesn't know any of this is going on. Um, or, you know, he doesn't know about Vadim Popyuk, he doesn't know about Paul Sasha, he doesn't know about, um, you know, all the corruption that's, that, that I and many others have experienced, in which case he has lost control of his, his organization um, because he's very close to all of these people, right? So he is the commander and then there's, there's sort of sub-commanders below him. Um, so, you know, because of that, you know, because of, of you know, that it's like if he does, if he, if, you know, if he doesn't know what's going on, well, that's very sad and that's a pretty terrifying thing to be the head of the intelligence chief doesn't know how his own oper like you know, teams are operating um, or he does know. And I suspect he may, he may know. And if he does, you know, that that's very serious because um, the reason you're seeing these these operations in Africa realistically is uh, Gore is looking for more operational fun funding and they love, they love operations to get into the headlines. They, that's why they do all this crazy stuff. They go into Belgrade, they go, they go in uh, into Russia, um, they uh, attack you know, civilians in Belgorod, they do these things not because they they have no real military value, almost nothing. In fact, they actually endanger uh, military operations because the, the concept of, of, you know, effectively a partisan warfare is, you know, that if we go back to the French resistance in World War II, the way partisan operations are supposed to be run is they are primarily an intelligence operation, which then facilitates further special operations or sabotage or some sort of support operation for conventional ground forces. That is what they're supposed to do. If you're going around in Russia and you're shooting up people, you're not being a very good spy, right? Uh, generally, it's it's not a good idea to be going around uh, shooting people up. So, because you're gonna bring a lot of attention to yourself. And so this has been a constant problem. It's, I don't think it's just unique to Vietnam. It's a problem across the Ukrainian military where they will be given a capability. And there's a certain company I've worked with and you know I've worked with um, in the past, and they they linked with uh, Gur. And their capability, it was, it was it's okay. It, it definitely needs a lot more development, but that capability was used against um, you know, Russian air power, which was a good idea. Um, however... As soon as the Ukrainians get this capability, they immediately use it. They don't save it up, and they and what happens is the Russians then develop countermeasures against it. And the reason for this is there's a lot of internal fighting between Gur with me within the military on top of you know the fight that's going on between obviously the president and uh, the chief of the armed forces. Sorry, you, you um, just dropped out for a second. Then you said there's a lot of infighting between Gur and and then it cut from there. Sorry. Yeah, so there's a lot of infighting between Gur, SBU, uh, SSU, all the different branches of, of the Ukrainian military, in addition to the ongoing fight between Zeluzhny and the president as well. So, yeah, we, uh, you know, it's, 
because of that, you see a lot of these these operations, and they actually, as I said, degrade uh, potential strategic effects. Um, uh, you know, which is which is sad. You know, it, and it is sad. So, and, and on top of that, you know, yeah, the stuff in Africa. I mean, if if we're if we're starting a war in the continent in the continent of Africa, I mean, certainly, I I understand. I think we should be confronting Wagner in Africa. We should be going around the world to do that. I suspect, though, it is mainly though to get a like a line of of funding and to get favor, curry favor with with uh, CIA. Is what I believe because CIA has proven to be pretty inept at dealing with Wagner and dealing with Russian and Chinese influence, which is which has been the case, you know, for decades. I mean, we go back to the Angolan Bush War. I mean, the US was just getting its fucking ass handed to it. Um, which which has been unfortunately the the trend for a lot of global conflicts of the US not performing well. Right. Well, that's that's incredibly interesting about about this because you know it's sold in the media and uh, throughout you know social media and stuff that these undercover you know special ops fast hitting shit is very effective. Uh, but are you saying it's more effective, more as a propaganda tool? Uh, media headlines than it actually is at frontline effect. That's well, exactly what it is. Like that's exactly it's a, it is exactly designed to be a propaganda tool. Uh, it's not designed. I'm just sorry, an information warfare tool, I should say. But yeah, I mean, it, if you're a, you think like every time the French partisans or the communists would fight back or try and form some form body against the Germans. They couldn't do it. They couldn't They couldn't win a pitched battle because they have no lines of supply. They could fight until they ran out of ammunition and, and then they're screwed and surrounded. Additionally, if you commit an act of sabotage or any of these operations, what you're not seeing is what happens is one, that entire cell is wiped out. So it can't conduct any future operations. They've now spent it. It's it's the way of thinking of it, it's like, it's like poker chips, you, know, you cash chips out. Right. And, uh, you know, now they can't operate. Additionally, anyone who's worked with them is now going to be targeted. And there's, and even if you haven't worked with them, just like with the Germans, uh, they're going to come and they're going to target the civilian population. So that is something. And that's what really gets under my skin and really makes my skin crawl is to see those kind of very poorly planned, very dangerous operations, um, really for a lot of media clout. Um, and we saw that with a lot of the, um, like the river crossings, you know, a lot of those were just, uh, you know, they, you know, those, those are something else. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk just about that river crossing because you, um, I can't remember the term you said, but about down at Crinky, um, the, the virtue, signal the virtue salient, signaling yeah. salient. Uh, what do you yeah. make of that? Because me looking at that, what's being held down in Crinky, I'm like, this that you have to be taking casualties here crossing people across water where there's a 24-hour isr on that position like it, it's it's a very small position so realistically russia have to have observation on only a few kilometers which a few drones can cover that 24 hours and you know drones can be That's up for a while so you don't need that many times and you've got to cross people across boats there incredibly slow um trying to minimize your your, your thermal imprint by not using motors and stuff like even smaller for such a small area being constantly hit by 500 kilogram fabs off russian bombers from glide bombs I, I don't get what is actually trying to be expanded there is it trying to expand into a bridgehead to get things across to then have a southern push but to do that you're gonna have to set up bridges and get armor and a massive amount of equipment it doesn't seem to make sense exactly why that area is being held that would have to be having it'd have to be having large attrition on forces. Oh, look, it's that entire offensive, that entire river offensive was an unmitigated failure. The wet I had Western intelligence saying that this was the greatest four-dimensional chess move. Now, if I had a map, I would show, you know, the Herson spit, sit, you know, spit and the, you know, the the AO of, of where we're talking about. I mean, when you look at that that you know the area around Hassan, you know it's a very small area so there is the whole point of a of an amphibious landing is it create it's a strategic maneuver to create operational good operational effect all right and what that means is a bunch of i just use a bunch of army wank words so i'll explain the uh, the way what you're trying to do so in d-day 
we, you know, the Allies landed in Normandy, you know, they obviously landed in the south of France as well. The reason for that is the Germans couldn't defend everywhere. So they chose a specific area where the Germans were weak. They didn't have a lot of defenses, landed it, then rapidly within about three days established a strong bit bridgehead. Um, other than Omaha Beach, there's very little resistance. Um, generally opposed landings almost always fail um, and take incredible amounts of training to succeed. So knowing that, what Ukraine did is they attacked where the enemy was already dug in. They contacted the enemy. They then, the enemy immediately knew where they were. In addition, the the enemy has artillery across the entire, I told this to, to, to Australian intelligence, like, do you understand artillery will just destroy everything that goes across that river? And that's exactly what we saw. We saw Russian artillery move in first. And then within about a day or so, we saw Russian armored reserves then counterattacking anything that had got across. Um, and so, like, and so the, what generally with any offensive, you know, after about three or four days or so, if we, if we stop seeing movement, um, generally what that means is that the offensive has stalled, like that axis has stalled. So if an, if an axis has stalled, it then needs a secondary axis to create what we would call a cauldron or then to isolate and push the enemy back. Or they need to then just like, you know, double their efforts and conduct a, a breakthrough, which is sort of what we saw near uh, uh, Robivne, right? They, the, the, the Ukrainians were attempting to do a breakthrough and unfortunately they, they just ended up losing everything, sadly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it it was literally, I mean, this, this, this crinky salient, it has literally no operational significance whatsoever. It is some of the best soldiers Ukraine has. It was 37th and a couple of other units stuck there, basically encircled, being slaughtered because General Zeluzhny does not want to lose face um, and is is basically covering his ass. Um, and that's that's why that's happening. There is literally because you need to establish that that bridgehead very quickly, and you need to expand it to be to push it out of the range of artillery. Because if artillery can hit your bridgehead, you can't get anything across. It's now isolated or encircled. So yeah, you, you your tone has taken a bit of a hit um, from when we last spoke. From one of I guess a lot of you know careful optimism to fairly pessimistic to how things are looking on the front line. Why do you think, what what has changed? Like in this six months or so that we've spoken, maybe it's more, what what has changed, do you think, that has changed? Because I love your brutal honesty in this. Uh, and I know you're not just talking at your ass because you, you actually care. That, that The reason why you sound pissed off at things is because you legitimately give a shit. Um, what do you think has changed in that six months that has really led you to this sort of different opinion on where this is going and what's happening? I, I would say, well, I, I would say I have, a, I, I would describe myself as being more realistic yeah. um, in, in, in my, in my view. Um, yeah. the, the, the pessimistic uh, part, I mean, I, the, the reason I, I sound pissed off is I know where this is, this is heading. And I think a lot of people are starting to realize where this is heading. It's not just me anymore. And, you know, as I said, I said in the last interview, like, I really hope I was wrong. I deadly wanted to be, to be so wrong. And I, you know, it fucking pisses me off that I wasn't, but, um, you know, uh, but yeah, the reality is that the loss of life is probably the biggest one. Um, you know, you I can talk about all the resources and the situation, but the biggest thing that Ukraine needs to win this war is it needs its people and it needs to protect its people. And it needs to protect particularly its most valuable asset, which is its soldiers. And the rate of casualties that are being exchanged, um, Maria Beluza came out uh, to the RADA and disclosed to the public it's about 3,000 a month, I believe, uh, Ukrainian soldiers. That's the official Ukrainian statistic. Um, that's a lot of fucking people. So about like, 100, you know, 100 a day. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of people, right? Um you know, and that's on low, supposed low tempo operations. So just seeing the mass slaughter, I think, of of Ukrainians and just the total mistreatment of them and of Westerners definitely is, is, is something that's affecting my mood. I mean, if we're looking at the strategic situation clear-eyed, um, the, the problem, as I said, the core issue is Ukraine cannot export. It has a current account deficit. 
And that is a result because it, it just can't get, you know, its exports up. Um, there's all these stupid fucking solidarity corridors and all this shit. The only thing that will, there's two things that could potentially help the Ukrainian economy. The first is increasing shipping through uh, the Black Sea to Ukraine or more integration with regional partners. That would largely help, um, you know, local economies. It wouldn't necessarily help the overall economy, although, you know, over time that could result in more tax revenue. The the core issue that, that you know, unfortunately Ukraine is facing regardless is that, you know, with, again, without those exports, without an energy surplus, it, you know, it, it's it's not going to be able to pay for itself. It's not going to be able to be sort of self-sustaining. There have been attempts by the government to try and introduce things like the Danes of an innovative project called Trade for Aid, and they've gone to Davos to try and get investment. But unfortunately, what people are going to discover is that much of the corruption, a lot of the war and a falling uh, consumer base because so much of the population has left. There's a huge demographic crisis. That means you're losing your consumer market. All of that is going to infect it. What well, Whoever invests potentially could be making a loss, potentially, right? It's not in every aspect or every industry, but it, it's a very bleak situation. And until Ukraine you know, puts its country onto life support, uh, investors will just, they just won't want to touch Ukraine. It's, um, you know, Israel is a good example of a country at war that can basically put it itself onto survival mode and countries still invest, even though the country is at war, uh, because they have confidence, investors have confidence that, you know, the Israeli government will, will pull through and their, their workforces are worth protecting and keeping in Israel. So, you know, it's a, that's a good example. Um, unfortunately, uh, Ukraine, whilst they have taken steps, they have not taken anywhere near close to the amount of steps that, that really probably need to happen for its, uh, for its survival. And that, that is very sad because, you know, the Russians are also, their economy is going down the toilet. Uh, they, you know, they're having, uh, they also have a current account deficit. It's, they're sort of closing it at the moment. They're sort of catching up. But uh, yeah, they're still going through their um, fund for the future generations uh, fund. They're still going through that. So they can still keep paying for this war. Um, and they've also effectively nationalized a lot of their economy, which is, which is it's good in the short term and it's long for them. It's bad for them in the long term, right? Because if you, you're growing the economy artificially through government spending. And because of that, That'll eventually turn them into sort of the Soviet, you know, essentially worse than Soviet Union. It'll turn them into a sort of North Korea because there's no there's no demand. It's all powered by a, a powered by inflation, which is just you know printing money. Which mm -hmm. uh, you know, high inflationary rate is very bad because you don't. And Ukraine is a very high inflationary rate because you can't invest because if you're a business, your goods are worth less. If you're a consumer, your money's worth less. So, you know, it creates a lot of instability in, in, in the economy. But overall, uh, Ukraine is just doing much worse, unfortunately, on the demographic side, the population side, the economic side, and all the lights uh, are just sort of flashing red at the moment, sadly. Yeah, well, Kiev Independent had an article today just about, and it was titled something, uh, something's the note of why no one is investing in Ukraine. And they, they talk about just the uncertainty in the market that, yeah, there are things like BlackRock and Vanguard putting money into Ukraine, but these companies can also afford to lose money. They can afford to take that bet on the size that BlackRock and Vanguard are and don't, and don't maybe not have the average Ukrainian person in the best of mind trying to buy up things like farmland and, you know, power as well, uh, with Russia's economy. It, Russia's economy is a tough one because you have these nationalized companies uh, like uh, Gazprom who do turn massive profits and it can be funded straight back into the military and the government as well. And, you know, Russia are increasing trade with other countries in the world of which they didn't previously, places like India and China. And people who don't think that Russia is still selling record amounts of gas and crude are wrong. They may be selling it at a lower price, but the sanctions on Russian oil are on refined Russian oil. Russia is now exporting record amounts of crude. It's getting refined in other places in the world, and we're buying it back refined. 
uh, which the sanctions have just not hit that. Basically, it, it's it's you know it has affected. I'm not going to say it hasn't affected, but there's the way around it uh, that you know Russia are you know somewhat fixing of you know in a long way around some of this and have increased their budget, have artificially inflated things. But at the end of the day, their country is full of shit to dig out of the ground or pump out of the sea, and that money can continue that flow if not sanctioned uh correctly sure so the thing so the thing i, I would point to uh, venezuela so venezuela also has oil literally coming out of its out of its ears the problem that venezuela has is it has a total lack of foreign investment capital and what that means is that if you want to start uh, an oil company well one it's nationalized and two, so to, to run an oil company is a, a very expensive venture, right? You have to have refiners, you have to have all these these very advanced uh, systems, you know, uh, to, to run it. And to have to pay for that cost, you need demand. And unfortunately, Russia has, does not have the same demand that it did. The, the level of demand that it was it was supplying to the West is just much greater than what they got from uh, China and India. So the Russian. Uh, Oil and gas industries are sort of are sort of slowly dying. Uh, oil less so, um, but gas definitely. Gas has uh, definitely been uh, a big, big one that's been hit. Um, but yeah, like it, it all comes down to whether because it, where Russia has done okay is is with grain exports. So because Ukraine can't export its grain because they signed this terrible fucking grain deal. That was just it was designed it was designed to destroy you know the competition effectively that's what it was designed to do because it allowed russian uh it allowed the you know vessels to be stopped um you know you know ukrainian vessels to be stopped if, if they suspected having weapons which was just to you know you create restrict supply and increase you know russian grain prices um and so then they so what happened is you know we had you know essentially ukraine grain disappear from the world market and then russian russia had a bumper harvest and they they sold like hotcakes and so they're like there's there's examples like that there's other examples throughout the russian economy where overall they are trying to close their a current account deficit if they can do that then if they've you know they've got more exports than imports you know potentially they could make some some tax revenue off that um, it's just really a question for, it's sort of like, this is a big, uh, it's a big poker, poker match, right? It's a big, you know, everyone, they're, they're just seeing how long both sides can sort of hold their breath. Um, unfortunately, as I said, the, the Ukrainians are just, they don't, they don't have a long-term plan. And right now things are just, yeah, they're just flashing red. Um, they, they can't export, you know, until, until that happens. And, and we gave a number of, um, me and my team, uh, you know, uh, Black Seas and, and other groups and my my team of people from Australia, we, we gave a, uh, essentially a, a submission recommendation of how to fix this, how to put the country on life support. And um, yeah, unfortunately, it just it just didn't really get get listened to. Some parts did, other parts didn't. So, uh, And what is your take at what's happening on the front line now? I quoted you just the other day because last time we spoke, which... You know, it was at the end of the Ukrainian counteroffensive, say, so let's say six months ago, you were saying while Ukraine has time, while the weather's okay, they need to be focusing on digging in proper defensive works, not a few trenches, proper concreted in, over-the-top protection, trench systems, defensive works, while they can do it. Like we saw the success of the Surovikin line, in southern Ukraine, Ukraine need to do similar if Russia push on the offensive. And what we are seeing, at least by the maps, and this is why I'm asking, at least by the maps, we're seeing that Russia is taking back a lot of the ground that Ukraine gained during its spring, summer, start of winter counteroffensive. What is your makeup, I guess, of what's happening up and down the front line, I guess, broadly? Um, I mean, I'm, I was dealing literally with the same problem I dealt with when I first arrived last year, which is a complete lack of defensive positions. Um, there's a report written back in 2014 by the Potomac Institute, um, and there were lessons learned by the Ukrainians um, and in conjunction with other partner forces um, that, you know, pre-built, um, like, casemates and bunkers were absolutely vital for surviving on the battlefield. Um, you know, this is an artillery war. 
it's sort of changing more to a drone war now, but it, you know, it, it, it was prim, prim, principally a, uh, an artillery war. Right. And because of that, TBI is a huge issue, um, which, you know, one of the best ways to deal with it is going underground. Um, unfortunately, the situation on the ground in regards to defensive works are they effectively are none. People are fighting in muddy holes if they can get that. Um, it's very ramshackled and sort of put like last minute put together. Um, the Ministry of Digital Transformation has been put in charge of uh, the third line of defensive works, um, which again tells you the president's confidence in the military to build defensive works. Jesus, um, right? We, yeah. I don't know. The, 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 to be fair, the, 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 the Ministry of Digital Transformation is sort of like, uh, it's kind of the, the non-Soviet part of the, the military. It's got a relatively okay reputation. They, unfortunately, they've, it's like the Ukrainians use them for everything. So, you know, there was a couple of guys, I think, from Digital Mil Ministry of Transformation. They didn't have anyone who was an S2, so they just made a couple of blokes with laptops because they're good programmers, like S2s and G2s. And it's like, these guys don't know how to do any IPBs. They don't know how to do any intelligence preparation. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's rough. So, but, you know, they, they were brought in to do that. You know, it's, again, it's the wider problem with, uh, you know, between the, the, the president and the military. But, yeah, ideally, as I said, yeah, as I said, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't copy necessarily the Russians, but I would bring in, yeah, pre-made positions um, that, you know, again, mutually supporting the arcs, you know, uh, pits, you know, that are actually hardened um, with very good um, QRF. A lot of people were like, as you remember, a lot of people were like, dunking on the russian defensive works um which you know i mean some of them way they're put together it's not the best but what people fail to understand is that mathematically uh under zvinko lanchester's law it, you know the more defensive works you build um the less combat power the less personnel you need to man the front so you can thin out your front and you can actually then reapply that combat power which is one of the reasons why russia has been able to take the offensive so um, unfortunately, uh, Ukraine waited until the until the you know the winter before they started digging, which by then it's it's too late. It's the the ground's frozen, so that's why you're seeing one of the reasons why these positions are buckling because they're untenable positions. Then the Ukrainians don't have enough personnel, so they, they just start fucking falling back to wherever they can go, and the positions aren't mutually supporting. And so you have you know in different sectors, you know your Russian advances. Um, which is, you know, unfortunate. Yeah, and, and Russia is taking back, you know, a fair chunk of land up near Terni, Avdivka, down in the south and Zapoblast. That, you know, they are taking back ground. It, it may be small relative to the size of Ukraine, but, you know, people said that Russia, that the uh, power of having an offensive was obliterated, and it doesn't look like that. We know Russia's got 40,000 troops apparently down in Kherson, as, as they must have said, that this is a very dangerous area. That's where, you know, Krinky is. And that they've amassed a number of troops up in the northeastern corner and as well down down the front line. I think there was this underestimation of the Russian forces that they're destroyed. Don't worry about it. Let's move on. Wait for next year's offensive. I think there was an underestimation there. You spoke about this disconnect between the president and the military can you speak to us about what we're seeing in the media, what we're seeing third, fourth, fifth hand, is that there is a battle between Zhiluzny and Zelensky, of course, the chief of the military and the chief of the country, the president of the country. Uh, we've been hearing rumours for a number of months that those two have been butting heads, and it seems to all have started about when Zhiluzny came out and said, look, the counteroffensive has failed, basically, maybe not wor words to that effect. Uh, and yesterday, the day before, Zelensky came out and said, you know, we need every, we're going to have a reshuffle. We need people who believe in victory. Uh, and I think we don't need people who believe in victory. We need people that can carry you to that victory. Believing in it is one thing. My cousin believes in unicorns. It doesn't mean that they're going to exist. <laughs> you need someone who can actually put that into place. And Zelensky's popularity is far, far beyond Zelensky's. Can you speak to us about, I guess, what's been happening there 
and what the potential yeah, fallout sorry. could be from sacking someone as popular as Zulusny? Well, it's yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting question. Um, so the people I work with, yeah, they're they're on, they are connected to the president's office, and some there are other people who are, um, who, who are near to the president. Uh, I believe it was uh, Maria Beluza recently. So there was so essentially the president, the president is frustrated um, with uh, Zaluzhny, which is fair. Zaluzhny uh, is not a very good general. A lot of people have, he's very liked by nationalists. He's very liked by people in the military. He's considered this non-Soviet general, which is sort of, you hear it from a lot of Ukrainians, it's sort of the excuse for everything. You know, if it's raining, the Soviet Union did it. Um, but, you know, sadly, Zaluzhny's, uh, uh, to put it bluntly, a bit of a fucking idiot. If you read his, his little paper that he wrote, it's essentially a bunch of finger pointing and um, avoidance of of of, uh, of blame. Um, he talks about you know using drones and all these different things. As as I mentioned, you know he was very much in charge of the offensive down south. Um, he the president has uh, put Sierski essentially. He's given him more prominence in the north. And uh, General Sierski, to those who don't know, he was the chief of staff. To General Mujenko in um, the Battle of the Baltima, he is extremely disliked in the military, absolutely fucking despised. And unfortunately, uh, the president has a very strong relationship to him. Uh, so there's there's that. Um, you know, Zaluzhny again is not a great great commander. Um, he also, but he also represents the faction and essentially the opposition because the the opposition that exists in Ukraine prior was pro-Russian and is not really considered credible by a lot of Ukrainians um, for obvious reasons. And so, you know, Zaluzhny has sort of become this force, I guess, for like kind of reform. Uh, the battle that we're seeing has been actually going on for, for some time. I think, you know, the president is disappointed with Zaluzhny's poor performance, which is very obvious. I mean, if we look at, you know, the operational offensive, um, Zaluzhny's operational uh, concepts were just absurd. They were just, I mean, the guy, again, either has no fucking clue what's going on at the bottom, in which case he should resign for incompetence or should just, like, like he fucking knew, like he attacked on seven different axes of attack. You know, the West told him to attack on one, which I think is stupid, but, you know, at least like three to four, you don't need seven. Now, to be fair to him, I mean, the president moved some of his stuff up to help Sierski and, you know, Operation Buck Moot Drop, which me and my boys were a part of. But, you know, which was a mistake. But at the same time, like, yeah. So, so these are the sort of driving frustrations. It has bubbled to the service previously through other people. So Maria Beluza, as previously mentioned, uh, came out and uh, effectively had asked for uh general uh, Zaluzhny to resign um general Zaluzhny did not resign um and has sort of just sort of sat around um sort of white ending the president the president's also quite angry with Zaluzhny because Zaluzhny was effectively press ganging people off the street so there's this belief there's this this anger uh in in Ukraine by soldiers which I, I think is fair uh, to a large degree, which is, and, you know, I understand it, which is the feeling that, you know, they're being left behind and that they're fighting. If you go to Kiev, like, no one gives a shit about the war. I mean, everyone's driving cars. No one's riding public transit. You know, the bloke who operates the fucking Ferris wheel in Kiev has a, drives a Maserati. I mean, you know, it's very obvious these people don't, like, a lot of people just don't care about the war and it's very it's, that's very jarring to people who are out there sitting in a trench so uh solution is kind of the the force the force for that um where it goes from here um uh the rider has asked for which the best the best case scenario is the rider has asked for uh general zabrowski uh to to be essentially made to ic uh, of solution and potentially to take it over some people have theorized it'll be Budanov, it'll be Sierski. If it's Budanov or Sierski, we're fucked. If it's Sabrowski, we've got a chance. Sabrowski is a very, very good, he's one of the few good uh, Ukrainian generals. He led the 95th back in 2014, um, and he is a very creative uh, commander. However, 
uh, at this point, it doesn't look like Zaluzhny is going anywhere. Um, he, he hasn't made it clear that he's going to resign. If I mean, in most 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 other countries, the civilian authority is superior to the military authority. Yeah. I have my issues with the president. The president certainly has is not got clean hands. Um, the RADA, I think there's questions of legitimacy in the RADA. There's questions of there haven't been elections recently. There's there's a real backsliding in democracy. We've seen um, people attached to the former Yanukovych government near the president. We've seen uh, you know journalists being arrested, particularly the journalist who was uh, who uncovered a lot of corruption in. Uh, the Defense Department in Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. the the whole jacket scandal, and and the food scandal, um, you know, and they're, they're being targeted supposedly on behalf of the president. So, yeah, as I said, it, it, it's sort of really it's reaching this very this this, this boiling point. I mean, generally, uh, Jim Mattis, generally in most countries, Jim Mattis would be a good example of what a general should do when his political leadership has lost confidence in him or vice versa. Uh, as a soldier, you know, regardless, you know, the president was elected. He is the civilian head of government. The, he is the commander in chief constitutionally, and we, you have an obligation to serve him. If you disagree with him, you can advise him. You could go to the RADA or you could go to the courts. Um, there's free options. Illusion he's done none of those things. He's effectively, gone out and publicly yeah and and has and have the rada they've both publicly had this big public spat and it's very inappropriate and it weakens ukraine's position immeasurably um and yeah it's it where does it end uh as i said one of those free options i would hope there is some talk of a of a potential coup that i i think that's very unlikely i think what we would see potentially is uh, maybe like a Prigozhin style charge towards Kiev at the most. Oh, Jesus, um, and then, the then it would be a question of, I don't know. So, but that, that, that would be, that would be the worst, worst case scenario. I, I think, I mean, this is why the president, I don't think has fired or brought in many reforms, uh, to the military is because there is a fear that the military will, will revolt, which it, it kind of already is. It's already revolting. Uh, in the sense that, like both sides, Russia and and um, Ukraine, don't really have very good command and control. And as 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 you saw with the um, the landmines treaty that they signed, they said they can't enforce anything. Um, that's that's very much you know my experience and and the reality on the ground is you know people they've got these little sort of pirate ship units that kind of roam around and kind of do their own thing they can be sort of told by generals what to do but it's not very effective command and control it's a very loose sort of pirate ship army and yeah. sometimes the pirate ships work with each other sometimes they fight each other sometimes they fight the russians um you know and yeah that is a fucking that is a a recipe and you you also remember the fact that a lot of the you know soldiers pay sometimes comes from donations that's a recipe to end you know, to, to not have an effect in military and for things to end in disaster. Well, this is exactly what Wagner PMC was, was, you know, it was a militia outside of the typical military, but funded loosely through there as well as, mil you know, some military equipment, whatever, but was funded through private investment of a number of, you know, Russian oligarch billionaires. Where does their actual faith lie? Wow, fucking wasn't with, well, on that day, it wasn't with the Kremlin that they turned back around. And I've spoken publicly, uh, and I've been shot down a lot for saying this, that I believe Ukraine, no matter, even if they completely win the war, clear Crimea, clear Donetsk, Luhansk, are still going to have a problem with some of these units because these far-right-wing units are not going to exist in the EU, NATO. The EU and NATO cannot have those heavily armed units under this ideology in it, and it will be told to clean that up. And these guys aren't going to want that. Uh, it's just you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend right now. Uh, where is this going to go? And I, I don't know if I can see a, a coup level happening while the rush is on the border because no matter how much, at least in my opinion, no matter how much in hatred there is, it doesn't compare to the outer hatred towards Russia. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's why we're not seeing a lot of action, actually, mm. is because of that reason. You're not seeing a lot of action because whoever takes the first move 
right, is going to be considered undermining the war effort. The, the president's already taken a big hit for uh, going after Zeluzhny, right, and going after parts of the military. This is why he doesn't want to, he's worried that this could spiral out of control and you could end up with a, a balkanized military where, you know, small unit commanders stop listening to uh, high command. You know, the problem that Ukrainians face, I, I don't think is intent, like, is entirely unique to them. Uh, the biggest problem, why things are the way they are in Ukraine, is that is both in the West and in Ukraine, uh, a, there is a total lack of accountability. There's just a total lack. There's no system um, by which all the stuff I saw in Zap, all the stuff I fucking saw, you know, the fucking CIA losing fucking uh, ecotes, you know, that they'd fucking donated to one of the teams and they, they, they got lost the first op and, you know, bags of cash being handed out for essentially one of the worst operations, you know, that's happened out here. You know, there's no, who do I go to about that? Who do I report to? I mean, technically there was, back then there wasn't even a U.S., proper like defense ombudsman there is now but i mean i've worked with the australian defense ombudsman and they spent uh, they went a whole year without accepting a single complaint from any soldier in the adf so look i, I just i mean and even if these ombudsmen are, are perfect people they're not gods on mount olympus you know they're they're, they're fucking you know they're, they're there's only so many of them right so even if they were great there's only so many cases they can look like look at and so much bandwidth. And if the president isn't willing to deal with this, then who's going to fix this? Mm. I can tell you it's certainly not going to be the local commanders extorting their, their soldiers um, and, you know, committing war crimes and, you know, doing stupid operations that they're not supposed to be doing just so they can put shit on Instagram. Okay, that's so, yeah, <laughs> it's a shitty situation, mate. Yeah, that, that lack of accountability... It, it, it has a huge operational effect then at the front line. It, it, it just does. That people always mm. point at me for, oh, why are you focused on corruption? Why are you not? If some pricks in the government have sp stolen $40 million worth of mortar rounds, isn't that isn't that in Ukraine's best interest? Isn't the most pro-Ukrainian thing you can do calling out this bullshit of these guys stealing these rounds? Because there's thousands of men dying from not like the biggest complaint off the front line that i'm reading everywhere is lack of mortar shells and lack of 155 and yeah, in the past week and a half we have had 40 million dollars worth of mortar shells that was embezzled out into people's bloody bank accounts basically uh, uh, holy shit like i cannot believe these guys on the front line are fucking fuming well like they would be that these people sitting in their bloody palaces driving their Ferraris now who have moved out of the country have you know purchased citizenship somewhere else holy shit uh it's a it's a horrible horrible thing that that is taking place and of course it's taking place on a larger scale in Russia uh, but mm. it doesn't mean just because it's taking place over there doesn't mean we have we can't hold people here to an account and say hey this is happening this needs to be cleaned up because that's $40 million worth of mortar shells that aren't helping the guys on the front line, that is not helping uh, your troops and has put now months and months behind of however many shells that $40 million uh, would have been. It, it's a, yeah, th that lack of accountability is just unbelievable that it's two years in and it's not, not currently there. And it just shows, it does show the systemic corruption in that system that these people are fighting against. And I have no doubt that guys like Zelensky and whatever, yeah, yeah, their hands may not be that clean, but at the end of the day are actively fighting against this. But I think too, they need to maybe reach out to like the West. Look, we're not keeping up with how much there actually is. We need, we need more push on this because if you actually look at the amount of people charged is very, very few. It just seems like there's shuffling around of people and some sweeping under the rug. And where does this actually then get accounted for? Like zero, yeah. zero Ukrainian uh, soldiers have been charged with a single war crime as far as I'm aware. Mm. And as far as, yep. uh, well, Glenn, who people probably by listening to this are aware. Now, I can tell you on Telegram, there is multiple that have happened from the beginning of the war. That doesn't discredit Russia's war crimes, but it means that there needs to be an accountability in the system. We can't just turn a blind eye mm. to everything. We cannot turn a blind, blind eye to the lack of freedom of press, the lack of, you know, uh, 
accountability for crimes that are happening, the corruption that's happening, and obvious laws being broken with targeting of wounded casualties, surrendering, which is falls into the war crime, and, and other bits and pieces. Like, where is the accountability in this? In the most publicised war that has ever happened, where the fuck is it? Uh, and it's well, having an effect on the front line. Yeah. The answer is that there is none, mate. There's, there's exactly none. And sadly, this is why, you know, people like me and others have to have to go to the media. And that's the difference between our system and the Russian system is you can't. You're not supposed to be able to go out and say, hey, this is this is fucked and not get some sort of reprisal, right? And we're seeing, you know, these sort of old tactics that were happening. I mean, as, as I said, the previous, you know, whistleblower, previous, previous journalist who covered corruption and, and exposed some serious corruption that got the defense minister fired uh, was targeted by, the, you know, what appears to be Ukrainian security services. Yeah, that's um, been well published so, actually currently. Um, yes. through Eve Kevd and Panic Kiev Post, whatever, are covering very in depth about this surveillance uh, arrests on a Ukrainian, like independent Ukrainian journalists there. Who I'll give from my from my journalistic you know, integrity, my hat off to them doing that. Like I mean, like the Ukrainian journalists sticking their neck out and going and investigating this. It's very, it's incredibly brave and journalist integrity to the max. Oh, it is. They're doing. They're fighting the fight. They're at the front line of the, you know, of fighting of fighting corruption. And then again, like the problem that we have is that the problem with bringing in the West. Now, I certainly agree, and I'm advocating, and I am desperately calling for Western intelligence services, militaries, you know, all 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 government, all branches of government, to pressure the Ukrainians to reform, um, because light sometimes has to come from the outside. But the problem is, is that dealing with corruption in any country is very difficult. Um, it, Ukraine has instituted a number of anti-corruption measures, which are actually, sadly, kind of stronger than what Australia has. Australia's got um, Australia's is, got a lot of corruption. People don't realise it because you yeah. think Bondi Beach in your undies on fucking going for a swim. Australia has yeah. a lot of fucking no. corruption. It's just not as Australia, obvious. Yeah. It's not as obvious as in Ukraine. It's not as yeah, in your not, face. But you don't have the same level of petty corruption because yeah. you, you, we have a much higher, you know, we have a much higher cost of living and a much yeah. higher. Standard you can't just of pay off a cop on the side of the road, but if you're some no. PHP executive, holy shit. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah, exactly, right. It's yeah. it's a it's a money it's a money issue. But then you know, yeah, like you know, people Australia's land mates and favors, but you know, Australia's you know anti corruption uh, commission or whatever it is has you know compared to Ukraine's, Ukraine's can actually arrest politicians, it can re arrest judges, it can arrest basically anyone except it, it is technically under the president, which is a big problem for um, a lot of reform activists in. In Ukraine, there are a lot of issues with um, how how it's structured. Nabu in general is is pretty good as well. The problem with all of it, as I said, there's just there's not enough of them. There's only about I think like a couple of thousand Nabu investigators, right? And so the solution is like, okay, well you're, you're going maybe catching one or two big fish, but what about all the other corruption? What about all this other stuff we see? And the only real solution, and like other countries struggle with this, Australia does not have it. You know, our anti-corruption bureau is exactly got the exact same problem. It will only go after a handful of people. Yeah. So you need some sort of wider mechanism, and and particularly as well, like you know, you need a wider mechanism that can target very rapidly people. You can say, right, there's corruption, and it gets fixed. So I had this problem when I was in, in the Australian Army. We had this issue with the EF eighty eight. Um, it, the, the bolts were exploding, right? They, they were exploding. We would get the weapon. You know, my commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel McLennan, was in charge of the weapons development. And he basically said, this is the greatest weapon. And he's written all these articles about it. It's, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread. And the weapons started exploding because they weren't quality assurancing the the weapon properly. They weren't testing them before they got to soldiers. One of them ended up exploding going into a dude's face. Um the whole thing was covered up. There was there is effectively no mechanism to resolve that. So that's very similar to what you see in Ukraine where you can see all these issues, but you can't really do anything. There's no one who's going to go out and do it because people get I mean in Ukraine this well in Australia, people get upset. Their reputations get hurt. People call them favors. In Ukraine, people have guns. 
and they've got these little fucking private armies that they can just say, well, fuck you. I'm, I'm in the Georgian Legion. I'll just go steal my shit and fuck off and we'll sell it on the black market. And you know, that it, it, it's, it, it's all, it's all been, everything's been put on the back burner, you know, in, in lieu of trying to win the war and really corruption has to come to the forefront to, and, and we need this sort of wide scale mechanism that can, you know, fix corruption very quickly. And we've proposed that to government, we've proposed the potential mechanism. Um, and it needs to be not just in Ukraine. It needs to be across essentially, uh, all allied partners it has to be across potentially like a new, I would, I would argue for even like a new kind of NATO, which is what we've, we've actually proposed and what the Rada chair has proposed is a sort of wider democratic alliance. This is what the Ukrainian government's kind of advocating for, which I think is reasonable. Um, that wouldn't have necessarily an article five, but could deal with corruption across borders. So the reason why that's important is the former, uh, reserve bank chair of Ukraine, which is a very important job. If you understand uh, anything about finance, investor confidence, yeah, yeah. if your reserve bank chair is a crook, no one is going to fucking invest in your country. And the, the chair of the reserve bank tried to steal a bunch of money and ran off to Greece. And no well, one, anyone who has a hands on the most money is in, in charge of reserves, reserve banks around the world. Yeah, well, he's he's just like he's just fucked off, and yeah, there's just there's just a lack of accountability there. And if you can you can do that, um, then you know how do you how do you solve the problem? So you need to have an anti-corruption system that can go across borders, that can solve these issues, because a lot of the, the corruption that goes in, on in Ukraine is actually targeted to people in the West. Um, you know, whether it's human trafficking, you know, the customers are in the West. You know. Uh, credit card fraud, hacking, well, that's all the customers are in the West. You know, the West has this problem too. And so you need, you know, sadly, you have to try and fix bit, both systems. And if we don't, um, we're just going to continue to see ongoing, you know, military failure. And that's been, that's been my prediction. And, and it has come to fruition. Sadly, we've seen, you know, the Russians obviously uh, have a number of successful operations in Africa. We obviously seeing what's happening in the Red Sea, where the U.S. is struggling, NATO very much struggling to secure their sea lanes. Um, very sort of yeah. And in addition to dealing with with China and the Pacific Island states, you know, um, you know, in our in our backyard. So, and, and not to mention what's going on at the border. So there's a yeah, there, there, there's a huge issue of accountability in the military if it's if it's not addressed. It just sort of grows like cancer, and um, I think I think in Ukraine they're just they're just very they're very worried, and I think they need support from you know outside policymakers to to do that. Yeah, what what level of importance do you get? Because it's October the seventh uh, in Australia, and October the seventh tomorrow in America, and by the time this comes out, we'll have an answer, I guess. But there's the vote today on the new Senate aid package to Ukraine. The, of course, this is linked in with border security measures and funding uh, down there. But the primary part of this, of the $112 billion, I believe, but $61 billion of it is for Ukraine, a funding from the US. And this has been held up uh, since October that the majority, who is Republican in the Senate, have voted it down and voted it down. And basically, they've gone away, rewritten it, and have like, just copied their old homework because it looks the fucking exact same. Today, the Israel funding got shot down uh, and people are expecting again this funding to get shot down in America. And, you know, we know, we know Europe cannot plug the hole of US funding. It just doesn't happen. Ukraine knows. Zelensky's come out and said this, that without US military support, we don't know basically what we'd do. What do you make of that? How desperate is that situation if that doesn't get approved? Um, I think it, I think there's a bit of there's a bit of there's a bit of theatre, there's a bit of exaggeration, but there are things that are very concerning. I mean, it's really more concerning for U.S. national security, if anything, because if the U.S. if the U.S. sits idle and lets Europe and wants Europe to take charge, uh, you're effectively you know, resigning yourself to allow the French and Germans to sort of to, to run Europe. And you're effectively, you know, sh you know, demonstrating that you're not a credible ally, particularly to countries like Israel. If Israel don't get their, their funding, the Israelis don't give a fuck. They have chutzpah. 
they'll go elsewhere. Don't worry. And they'll and they'll find a way to make the money. And they'll make you and you know, America will, will pay a price for that. And there is a price for that. Oh, yeah. So that that said, you know, I, I don't want to get too much into American politics. America has a very uh, complex political system that is imperfect, very much like every other country. I mean, we come, we come from Australia. It's a very imperfect political system there. Um, but, yeah, I would I would say that there is a bit of exaggeration in the sense that, like, so um, Ukraine can and the president of the U.S. have a few options. One, they, can, they could put their country onto life support. To um, uh, you know, the U.S. can the president can reappropriate funds from elsewhere in the U.S. government. That is an option. It is technically constitutional. That's made by the Supreme Court when Trump took money from you know funding for veterans' housing and put it into his border wall. Um, that's a very brute force way of of doing it. Uh, there is obviously the black budget as well, but. Yeah, to get the big the big dollars, yeah, they're yeah. gonna have to try but, and get something through Congress. But none of that it's, is tens of billions. Like, you know, black no, budgets aren't it, that much. No, the it, the reshuffling no, it doesn't, it doesn't in already right. an unpopular government like Biden is like it, this it, we're not talking sixty billion and that's shit. Oh look at that's like the minimum Ukraine need, uh, is sixty billion. They probably need hundred and fifty billion. Uh, the, and, it depends. I mean it it depends. Like a lot of the money and equipment that's gone over here, like a lot of it's been pissed up against the wall. A lot of it is going in, in like you look to where that money is is going. Um, you know, it's it's like, you know, Bradley's without trophy systems on well, they're they're gonna get destroyed. You know, you're gonna end up you, you have dozens of systems that probably aren't as needed. I mean, all of all of these systems are needed. Like don't get me wrong, they are they are needed, but whether the Ukrainians need to invest in them, because Ukraine can invest in its own domestic systems and right now it's it's trying to but it's it's just not they haven't mobilized their economy um and i wouldn't get them to mobilize it in the same way that russia has but they they you know they've you know they, they, there are things that ukraine can do to, to mitigate this that said it is it is a huge issue if if this doesn't pass event like what will happen basically what will happen ukraine's not going to collapse tomorrow what will happen is ukraine will enter a hyperinflationary spiral so it will be able it won't be able to buy as much so it's, it's purchasing power will go down the cost of living you know will, will increase so basically everyone's life the, the country goes into recession effectively which is super bad right it's, it's very 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 bad and essentially ukraine turns into uh north korea soviet union right that's where that's where this goes and then potentially they can't even fund their own soldiers which is what they said they i mean, remember the the presidential office said by by January, all funding to soldiers would stop. Why right? it, it didn't happen? It was, it's just sort of exaggeration. Um, but a lot of funding does come from the US, particularly for soldiers and, and the like. So, um, yeah, this this definitely this definitely has effect. Um, the fact is that Ukraine should not, is as I've argued, Ukraine should not seek to be as dependent as it is on the United States. I see my my recommendation to to you know, my five eyes contacts was that the West give a big lump sum support payment that was effective and worked and was effectively a long term investment. Um, and unfortunately, that was kind of ignored. And people just thought I, I had one Ukrainian commander to tell me that NATO will give the money forever uh, because NATO is stupid and gay. And there's lots of dumb gay people in NATO and they'll just keep giving us money and they don't have to reform. You know that that was the level of understanding to some people over here, and it, it's yeah, like so. But yeah, it, it is it, it is an issue. I think it will probably pass at some point. I think right now it may not because the I don't see the Democrats moving on immigration, especially before an election. They might they will probably struggle to do that. Um, that said, it is possible, and you know to be fair. Um, you know, this, I kind of do empathize with the Republican Speaker of the House where, you know, he's come to President Biden. He said, hey, you know, what's your plan? Um, and, you know, he said the same thing to the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians, the president rocked up, not with the the foreign minister, 
not the not the ambassador, I guess the ambassador of the U.S., but not the foreign minister. He he sent Andre Yamak. Hmm. Now Andre Yamak, the people who don't know, is a very 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 disliked person in Ukraine and in the U.S. A number of Republican Congress people have come out and called him out for being corrupt. He has endless allegations of corruption around him, and right now has a former member of Yanukovych's. Uh, Ministry of the Interior, which is effectively SBU, um, running uh, parts of the Ukrainian state. Um, there's allegations of, of connections to the Russian government, of embezzlement. And this is the guy that they sent to Congress. You could not send a worse person <laughs> to basically advocate for your country. It was. I could not believe that they sent him. I really just was beside myself that they sent him. And after the offensive has failed, if the offensive had succeeded, I don't think Ukraine would have as much issue as they're having now. I think you know American politics would have gotten the way, but people would have said, "Okay, these guys are, you know, they're winning. We need to keep supporting them." And the Hawks would have probably, you know, jumped on board because they would, you know. No one wants to support, uh, you, know, you know, no one wants to be on the losing team. But unfortunately, Ukraine is being portrayed and in many ways is a bit of a sinking ship. And that comes down to, again, as the Speaker of the House said, you know, what is the fucking plan? <laughs> what is the fucking plan? That's a fair question. And people attacking Congress people and saying, you know, oh, you shouldn't say that. Well, it's their right. That's their democratic system. So... Well, look, well, I think it was the Speaker of the House that said, we don't want another Afghanistan. We went to Afghanistan with no plan, yeah. and a trillion dollars later, we left by losing and rearming the people we fought, arming them better mm -hmm. and increasing the amount of talent, like increasing the amount of fighters. We armed them and grew them and lost, and it took 20 years and thousands of lives. And I believe it was him, but it was someone very high in the US who said, we don't want another Afghanistan what is the plan? Uh, and I think that is a realistic question is what is the plan in Ukraine? Uh, the plan is to win. Okay. How, how are we doing this? Uh, yeah. Because I believe the U S has, the U S has basically unlimited resource of training of equipment, you know, basically unlimited. Uh, they could win this, uh, but where's the plan to do it? How are you training a million men? How are you doing this and that? And all these tank you know 30 abrams but uh, fucking what is that like america yeah. probably has six thousand sitting in a field somewhere rusting um now of yeah. course it comes into we well, need people to man them you need the, the maintenance of it that ukraine can probably only take on the amount that they've sent but i, th I think the whole thing in the u.s is a lack of guidance for the people voting against it they go we want to know where this is going we just want accountability for the money mm. like 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 victor orban said now I'm not the biggest fan of Orban, but I understand what he said. He said, I want anything over half a million euros to be investigated of where the fuck is that being spent? And I want a review on it in two years of, is it being spent correctly? And, you know, we should have independent people looking at this money. I understand that. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't, I don't agree with Orban. I think Orban is, is very much playing a, 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 a double game. I think of course he the is. trick is to have, the trick is to play, the trick is to get, we want to get more support into Ukraine. As I said, we want it to be, we want to, we want to win this fucking thing. As George Patton said, you know, American, Americans like winners, that they're a nation of winners and our nation of fucking losers. And they want to fucking win. If we don't submit the, the resources into into supporting you know ukraine and we don't invest in this okay and we don't do that correctly and we don't make sure also that's accountable then yeah it's going to blow up the fuck in our faces and isw can fucking say all they want this is not like afghanistan and yes of course ukraine isn't afghanistan no one's arguing that but it could turn into a very it, i don't think it would turn into that situation but it could turn into a quagmire the U.S. needs to go in. We need not go in, but we need to to help Ukraine win this conflict quickly and swiftly, right? Because every day this this war is going on, right? We're pissing off the global south. We're pissing off all these other people. We've got China growing as a real threat, and there is an upper limit of support that the United States can give. You know, yes. I've, I mean, the U.S. could continue supporting Afghanistan, 
you know, for decades if it wanted to, but disaster and poorly planned. But, you know, the, eventually the US was like, right, we've had enough, we're going home. And that will happen. So, yeah, it is about making a very coherent pitch of like, this is what we need to win and how. Um, and that just wasn't presented. And what was presented, I, and, and this infighting that we're seeing in Ukraine uh, certainly does not fucking help it. I can guarantee you that. No, no, not at all. Not at all. For those who are unaware, um, your Mark, who you spoke about before, he was one of the guys all caught up in this like Hunter Biden bloody thing that's happened um, in Ukraine. For those, I guess, wondering about how all that's happened and the investigations that took place, but no, no public statements about it and whatever on from there. What do you make of what's happening in Avdivka at the moment? Because it seems to be Bakhmut 2.0 reliving that horrible horrible event that happened there this time last year yeah it's basically it's basically yeah worst buck move worst crinky it's just again the ukrainians keep they did this in the back in 2014 they just keep leaving their fucking soldiers to die to just be fucking encircled and destroyed it's effectively under direct fire encirclement uh yeah i mean it's it's just the they've, the russians have the high ground the the, the this is so fucking stupid i look it's when the I understand the Ukrainians are trying to hold on to urban centers, then the idea is that the Russians then have to attack them. And the, the Ukrainians have an advantage. They've got something to hide in. They don't have to build bunkers. They can hide maybe in the basements or something. They can fight from them. It's complex terrain. And they can also keep the Russians at bay. They slow the Russians down. And look, the Russians have spent a lot of equipment trying to take the stuff. And they have had a positive exchange rate. However, unfortunately, the Ukrainians have also suffered a lot of casualties. The reason for that is because these salients are hard to maintain. And at a certain point, if the enemy, so the, the Russians are trying to pincer and encircle, and they've now been able to pretty much do that in a deep cover, you've got, you've got two options. You can counterattack, right? You can counterattack and try and counter pincer, defeat the pincers and keep the salient kind of open, try and push the enemy back, um, you know, uh, attack by, you know, defending by attacking active defense, or you can fucking reduce your forces down to a rear guard or sort of stay behind troops and withdraw and then stabilize the line, withdraw in good order. Um, they've done neither. They just sat there and watched their troops get encircled, right? And then and then once they become, and this happened in Mario, they got encircled and then they just left them there. They didn't send a counterattack force. They didn't have any training to deal with breakout. The, the hardest thing for a soldier to do in any conflict is withdraw in good order. The best units stands today are the ones that can withdraw in good order. They can withdraw, they can counterattack, they can, they can defend their position even when it's somewhat untenable, right? But even the fucking best soldiers, you know, need some fucking support from higher. And unfortunately, these poor guys, they've just been left there. And it's, uh, it is a situation worse than Bachman. And there's really not much else really to say about it. It's, it's just, it's, it's sad that, you know, everyone who is, who has not been evacuated from that area, um, you know, is in, is in severe trouble. Unless they're going to stay behind as like some fucking secret partisan or reconnaissance troop or, yeah, they're, you know, what's the point? What was the point of losing, putting all those men there? And this is exactly what we were saying when, like, you know, human life, and I said, yeah, you know, human life is the most important thing. Because those guys have experience. They know how to fight. They, they've been there. You know? Uh, it's, yeah. And we have a demographic crisis. So, yeah. It's it's a disaster. Mate. So that's a difficult. Just in closing, what do you see occurring over the next six to 12 months where do you see this going is ukraine prepared for a further russian offensive are they prepared to go on their own is ukraine prepared to go on their own offensive where do you see this happening in 12 months i know personally i think the situation we came into christmas with this year will look almost the exact same in 12 months yeah i think there'll be i so i think the the russian offensive part of the russian offensive there's definitely been some kind of offensive in the north this recently kicked off it'd be interesting to see where that goes that's probably the most dangerous area at the moment as i've said uh, to you in private that's probably the most dangerous 
sector. It appears the current offensive is kind of stalled at the moment. Uh, short term, like we're, we're moving out of winter now. So any kind of offensive operations in the next few months is going to be very unlikely. Um, uh, doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but just, just knowing the quality of Ukrainian and Russian troops, that probably isn't going to happen. Additionally, the the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, you know, people like Perun and other people go out and they were like, look at all the equipment that's coming, look at all the stuff that's being destroyed. Um, the reality is, is a lot of that has a very little bearing on, you know, the reality on the ground. Um, most of the combat power that is additionally given will be committed to holding back the Russians in different sectors piecemeal. And they will, or yeah, I mean, if it does an offensive, I mean, I can't see it going particularly well because Russian defenses are still there. They haven't, they clearly have struggled a lot of the Western training that was provided. There was, again, no accountability to make sure that the Ukrainians could actually do that mission. A lot of guys were just sent half-baked into battle um and you know air defense and we saw the, the consequence of that so that that's a short term uh medium term uh the russians are building up uh forces in belarus um now what they're doing is they're taking uh police in belarus and they're training up to train them up to be combat soldiers so they're actually they're they're adding those to the ranks they're also adding um there's additional Russian forces that are being moved in. Um, in addition to a potential general mobilization in Belarus itself. So um, you're going to have about, yeah, I'd say about almost 100,000 troops potentially um, at, in, in about a few months or so. Now, that in itself is, it's a very limited force. It At its current rate, short term, it, if if every Wagner PMC came back, maybe they could do a raid. They could so a raid is very different to a conventional offensive operation where you know you're trying to hold ground. They could potentially push down through uh, near, try and cut off the the Polish Ukrainian border and try and cut that cut Kiev from that part. Uh, that's a potential uh, danger area. Uh, they could also do a general offensive and sort of try and push down um, from the north. Um, I don't think that's happening really anytime soon, though. I think primarily this is uh, their sort of, uh, you know, keep the... Po they're potentially preparing for this mission or uh, the take this for the gap, potentially, is, is preparing for World War III. So that's... That that's those are two options there. There's also the Russians have repeatedly said they want to retake really Odessa at some point. Um, so potentially we could see more covert action from Transnistria, or I doubt a naval landing uh, unless it was a mass naval landing, and it, it would be very hard to pull off. Absolute bloodbath. Um, it would. It would. I mean, like initially when the war began, there was actually a supposedly a, we know now, and I know from uh, different parts of my intelligence contacts that the Russians actually wanted to land uh, an amphibious assault in Odessa, and the Marines were like, "Fuck no." Yeah. Um, the Russian Marines were like, "No," <laughs> uh, and and that was right because they would have been isolated and and destroyed. So yeah. there is a possibility of maybe pulling something off, but it will require such ta good tactical planning that I, I don't think the Russians necessarily have. But it is a threat so uh, it's it's on the radar um but those are the those are the core sort of medium term long term it's a question of whether ukraine can fucking come up with some kind of plan to survive long term other than living off the west um that's really going to be the the long term solution russia will slowly its economy will slowly suffer However, at this rate, it can fight for roughly about 2.5 years still with existing artillery stocks. So Ukraine has only eliminated, um, I think, about a quarter of all Russian artillery. And that doesn't take so into account take, North Korea and China and other places sending yeah. them mass stuff either. And North Korea, everyone loves to dunk on North Koreans. Oh, fucking shit, blah, blah, blah. Maybe shit technology, yeah. they can pump. If you've got, if, you, if your whole bloody population is just basically slaves to the leader, they can make millions upon millions of shells. Uh, North Korea has the largest artillery call in the world, most guns yeah. in the world, and 
they mm-hmm. can make dumb shells. And I spoke about this in the video that went up only maybe half an hour ago. The West is too focused on smart weapons, on this fucking missile and this and that. What we've run out of? Dumb bombs. We don't have enough mortars and shells. And Russia can pl- – and and the West is too fucking expensive to make. $30,000 mm-hmm. a shell or $20,000 a shell – because of how expensive labor is and all this other shit, you know, even just down to how good the shells are. When do we need the quality or do we just need the fucking quantity? Like, are you if you're sending back a hundred fantastic shells, but you're getting five thousand just shitty ones back that a North Korean made, probably rather be on the side with the five thousand. Um, and and in my opinion, on on if Russia and I spoke about this too, if Russia want to continue this war with any objective they've got, whatever their objective is, they need Odessa. I I just, I can't, like, the Black Sea Fleet Mm. is so susceptible to the um, marine drones. It's so susceptible to them, as as has been proven again and again. They need to take Odessa. I don't don't know how they're going to, any of their plans of power in the Black Sea and Suez Azov and down towards Russia, I don't see how any of that comes about without them actually holding Odessa or having you know, a clear line across there, as well as with Ukraine. I don't see them having any effect into the south unless they can get somewhere like Tokmak, which is a long way. You've got a lot of defense to go through. And the defense isn't like where it was last year. They're going to improve the defense in in the south. Russia has taken back the majority, if not all, of the defensive lines that was originally taken. And they're going to... The biggest thing is that's thinking, oh, Russia's dumb, they don't know how to fight. Okay, we saw complete incompetence of the Russian military in the first year first 18 months let me give you that but they are learning learning slowly but those defensive lines will be better than they were last year and what is it that you're going to be going up against them with yeah exactly and it's uh, those defensive works will improve every day that you know it goes on and not only that if we look in the north what we're seeing is not that's not that was the first sort of operational fucking offensive action I've seen since sort of the war began. We've seen two axes pushing around one you know, near Kupyansk, and we have seen a sort of broad operational breakthrough. Now, a lot of that is due to, you know, manpower issues on the Ukrainian side, but, you know, they were able to attack on a wider front. They were able to take some ground. And if they had been able to continue that advance and, and ex- if that had been exploited by the Russians, I mean, that is the northern flank if 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 the russians start pivoting down they can start outflanking all the positions down south and if they then combine that with a general offensive right well then 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 we're looking at something very serious so that's an issue in regards to odessa yeah i mean like putin has said um odessa is russian territory intrinsic russian territory from ancient times that's his thing putin is not getting if we're talking about a peace deal, there is no fucking peace is not on the table. <laughs> it's not on the table for anyone. Um, there's just no interest in it. Uh, the Russians would own, maybe accept a peace where they get Nova Russia and a, they get to choose basically to turn Ukraine into Scotland and veto anything that Ukraine ever gets to do, um, essentially giving it control of Ukraine. Um, which no self-respecting government is ever going to agree to. So we're sort of at an impasse there. Um, the only maybe peace deal ever that could be struck is, uh, I mean, U- U- Ukraine needs the, the the left bank of the Dnieper to, to survive because it doesn't have the Dnieper River right now. So that's a strategic issue for them. Um, that's how they access the rest of the country. So any peace deal would have to include that, and then they would potentially have to cede back all that other territory that they can't get back. Um, but that's that would be a very very tough pill to swallow, and would be it it, it would be bad for Ukraine because they essentially lose that territory, which is not good. Nationalists would get very angry, um, but more importantly, it'd be terrible for the West because it essentially shows that might makes right. And that's what's being kind of demonstrated. And we're seeing in the global South, a lot of countries are just like Saudi Arabia. One's like, yeah, you're not that competent. Like you, like you guys talk a tough game, but you can't actually win wars. So why should we be listening to, to you? Why should we support you? Maybe we should go to the Singaporeans and the Israelis or the Indians, you know? So yeah, that that's, that's definitely the, the wider, I think the longer term issue. 
I think mean, core for you know Ukraine survival is yeah like being able to protect Odessa right now. Unfortunately, Ukraine has concentrated all its air defense in Kiev, um, because that's where the political class live. Odessa is really much more important um, because if a single ship is hit in that sea lane, the entire fucking economy of Ukraine it it, it, it suffers for it. And there's all this talk about deep water ports in Romania. That is a long term solution that is not a short-term thing it's not going to happen overnight and building up over time that port infrastructure will be built up but there is a bottleneck and, and romanian so, farmers have nothing ukraine, to do with it like every time ukraine try and get out grain between poland romania bulgaria anywhere hungary all the farmers are like we well, are undercutting us because it's cheaper and they line up on the border mm. and block it all through they're not going to want that yeah no they don't and that's it's again it was the very it was a very poorly constructed policy by because essentially what they're trying to well what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a demand side fix so they're trying to say right okay we'll sell into the eu but there's no real plan to do that because it would just flood the market right it's just it's not a viable thing and it's not where ukraine naturally exports and if they're not export if they're exporting there they're not exporting to the developing world who need it so the really the only solution is to have like yeah some sort of merchant marine with like it's the same solution to the red sea right you, you know the, the u.s navy can't defend its shipping lines it's just it functionally can't it can't defeat the houthis there's no how so the only real like i mean the defensive option is to you know mount like you know 40 mil auto cannons and just fucking make an armored merchant marine because like the ukrainians are able to export it's just when they're exiting the Black Sea is when they're getting stung and when they're coming into the port of Odessa, which is the only deep water port in the area. So again, I, I and Glenn, we went on different places, we went on Sky News and a bunch of different people and we begged and pleaded for NASAMs to be sent, but they never got sent. And the Ukrainians put all their AA and their power, combat power into Kiev, which is not what I would do if I was them. I'd build a new uh, national defense university down in Odessa and say, right, this is what we're fucking defending. This is where we're going to generate combat power. This is what we're going to do. But, you know, I mean, because what you can do is you can make, you can make a, you can potentially make Odessa work, right? You could say it's much more easy to investors to say, okay, look, the rest of Ukraine's fucked, right? But we've got port infrastructure here. We've got reliable power. We've got this, we've got that. All of the all of the risk factors for you investing are gone, right? That's a much more easier pitch. And then from there, you can expand that to these sort of, you know, innovation fucking nodes or zones or whatever, or special economic zones. And that would then slowly be able to sort of revitalize the Ukrainian economy. But um, yeah, at this stage, I mean, none of that's happening. Um, you know, Kiev's all the way up in the, the north of the country and they can't send anything down by river which means the cost of producing everything increases so yeah i mean economic it, it, there has to be an economic solution because without an economic solution there isn't a military solution oh, there, there are some but unfortunately budano's running around doing his um trying to fucking 360 no scope putin um with his special needs teams um and not just budano for like all the fucking ukrainian military hey, i'd um, be impressed then, if he pulled it off though Oh, pulled it off. Shoot. Well, like if you shoot Putin, let's say you knock him out. Like, what, 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 what happens? Like the yeah. Silviki just put someone else in. Well, that continues. that's the threat. Is is and people have spoken to me a lot, a lot about why don't they just take out Putin? Why doesn't the US do it? They could do it, but the thing is, we we sort of have this trust of Putin. As far as we know, you're a bad guy, but at least we've dealt with this bad guy for a long time. Who steps in? That was like when people saying knock him off and Prigozhin was there. Well, is Prigozhin going to be better there? No. Like, yeah, who actually steps into those shoes? At least we know Putin's not going to push that button unless we do. Uh, well, someone yeah, I mean, this is, Jesus, this is there, really like, crazy this, a lot of this there. comes down. Yeah, this is, this is what a lot of this comes down to like CIA intelligence failures because functionally there is no proper like Russian government in an exile. So like when Prigozhin went balls to the wall and tried to fucking drive to Moscow, there was no real response. The West was just like, what's going on? Oh, <laughs> you dude. Know, there was a real, there, there was they, an they opportunity just, there. Just, yeah, no, it was, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, you know, the whole point, I mean, like the French resistance was organized around a government of national unity. It had a clear armed branch. I mean, it was incredibly dysfunctional and borderline ineffective, but 
you know, there was a plan to sort of like, okay, this is how we bring in a democratic uh, resistance movement. The CIA runs these around in most countries around the world. They have some sort of stay behind force who does this. Um, but yeah, they just obviously, they either chose not to use their capabilities or they don't have the on ground, on the ground capabilities. And unfortunately, you know, Budanov, SPU and others, you know, doing these sort of missions that just, you know, like targeting people in Bel Belgorod with a couple of drones, you know, civilians, uh, it, it definitely it is very contrary to what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to get the enemy, as Sun Tzu said, we're trying to defeat the enemy's mindset. We're trying to get him to surrender. So, but yeah, that's not happening, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, mate, look, uh, one thing, as long as this horrible war goes on, that you and I will have plenty more conversations about things that is happening. And as, uh, as more comes available to talk about, about your, uh, leaving of the country, uh, as, as we can, because some of that is, you know, still well under wraps. Uh, it'd be great to talk about that with you as well. Is there anything, um, you'd like to say, you'd like to say that we, that you think we've missed? Oh, look, yeah. I mean, as, as I said, I, I, I mean, I, if people are feeling pretty down and depressed, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame them. Um, reality is, is that, you know, it's, it's not all over um there there is still hope and you know it just comes down to you know if people can if we can coordinate better we can we can turn this around because this is an existential crisis for for western countries right if, if, if you know if we can't if we can't support our allies you know this is gonna it's gonna bite us uh you know going forward and it, and it will affect particularly you know australia's national defense it's already affecting it because we have you know, above us in the Solomon Islands, we have, I guarantee you, the, the, the Chinese have, you know, their special activities guys in the Solomons. Oh, shit, yeah. There, with, with DGIs, learning from what has been learnt in Ukraine. And I can guarantee you that the Australian Army has no, like, it has, it has countermeasures, but down to the infantry level, no, it has no tactics, it has nothing. And the way that we can develop those and the way we can, because if, if guys get knocked out there, it's Australia that's next. And, you know, it's uh, the Australian government does have plans and has in the past conscripted people against their will to go fight. We don't have a big army. So, yeah, I think getting on top of, of defense reform, making militaries more efficient, um, that's really the solution. That way we don't have to go to that, you know, terrible scenario where we have to send fucking with doing what's happening in Ukraine where people are sending the the second member of their family to go fight and die because the third and fourth you know brother's dead so um yeah that, that would be my message and you know, if people want to people want to do something or they feel sort of hopeless I don't blame them um I've, I've left a link below I, I run a I'm, I'm now doing um I've been invited to do a lot of uh, due diligence and uh, defense analysis work some work with war crimes as well so people are interested in uh, linking up and working with uh, us on that they can at the moment all the work is uh is voluntary I, I don't really get paid but it's sort of once we get work or contractual work we you know we, we give people jobs as soon as possible so because a lot of people in the OSINT space unfortunately are, are not paid which is pretty pretty shitty so we're trying to fix that awesome well mate thank you very much i really appreciate your time and um and sending me over updates uh in between the the talks online as well don't mention, man. Just yeah, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't be on more, but yeah, just fucking dealing with bullshit. Uh, you're always welcome, mate, and I'm, um, I'm glad you're here to out to more, more relative safety. Appreciate it, man. Talk Thank soon. You. See you, bro. Bye bye.